activist, a writer, uh, an educator. Uh, she has really had a huge influence in this area in terms of the environment and the positive effects of the environment. Um, so I'm going to introduce Susan, and thank you so much for being thank you. here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming to hear about seaweed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I want to start by saying that uh, Helen and Scott changed the way that we thought about land in our lives on the land, and they really had a lot to do with a lot of us being here um, on the, in Hancock and Washington counties uh, and elsewhere. And um, so you never know, but I think this is another time when people are changing. When you're here and I'm here because we see something that's not working. And we are either brave enough or stupid enough <laughs> to think maybe we can change it. And it's going to be a lot of hard work. And when I look at those stone walls, you know, that you probably read their books about putting those, that cement and that stone in those, in those frames and then getting it up, I mean, it just sounded very difficult. The work we have ahead is, um, as you know, difficult, too. Um, so what I think I'll do tonight is um, to do some reading and talking. And I was looking at my talk, which I type up and then I don't use, um, but it's just, <laughs> it, it's just a nervous tick. Um, um, and, and it seems a little depressing. Um, but I want to tell you, before I even start, that just like Helen and Scott Nearing, who got out of um, a kind of a society that they didn't like and then tried to build one that they did like. I have found from writing this book that there are people, well, I know that they're in the, uh, along the Gulf of Maine in the state of Maine, but I am assuming that they're all over the world who are fighting the good fight, who are uh, have the kind of um, oomph to keep going and who don't put their heads under comforters when things get too rough, which, by the way, I sometimes do myself. Um, so they keep me going, and um, there, a lot of them are in this book. Um, so, but I'm going to start just by reading to you, and here's how I think we should go. I'm going to read to you. Uh, I'm going to follow some of this that I've written, um, some points I want to make. And if you have questions, you can ask them at the end, or if they're pressing and you think that you might not remember, just ask me now. Okay? And if I can't answer, I know there are people in the audience who can. So, this is from the prologue. What I want to tell you before I read this, I think, I want to tell you that I had to figure out how to lure readers in. And this book began six years ago now. And seaweed wasn't a hot topic, which it is now. So I had to try to lure you. I had to try to give you a story that you wanted, that you liked enough that you would turn the page and continue the story, and then I'd bring in another story. But they had to be based in science or stories about people who lived on the shore who were involved in seaweed. So this is how I decided to begin. <clears throat> Down East Maine, can everybody hear me? Down East Maine, where I live, is for me the most beautiful place on earth, even in February even on a dark day in a sharp wind. It is ledge and cobble, spruce and white pine, mud flats that glisten like a harbor seal's wet pelt, low tide rocks covered in layer upon layer of seaweeds, 
and a horizon straight east across the water into sunrise in Canada. No frills. It has been for me, and I think for so many others who live here, William Blake's grain of sand, a teaching place, and we have learned something of the world from it. Within the wild fabric of the shore, in its many coves and bays, seaweeds and other lives from barnacles to fish to birds are bound together as they are along the shores of other places in the world. It is a tightly woven warp and woof of life, an ancient and essential system of give and take. By the end of the book, I am assuming or hoping that you will feel that uh, everything comes back to seaweed. That's the intention of the book. In April, we can stand at the shore and see long lines of blackbirds rising and falling in undulating flight at the water's horizon, homing to their nesting islands. They are double-crested cormorants. They built their nests out of sticks and grass and the seaweeds they've ripped up from underwater. Flocks of robins return. Eastern Phoebes come back to the poor cheese. Both in a cold snap seek out the windrows of seaweed that lie in the sun above the high tide line, there in the warm, rotting tangles. Kelp flies and their larvae flourish. <clears throat> From deep underwater wintering places, adult lobsters lumber toward the inshore waters where their young find both shelter and food in the rocky seaweed beds. Fish tend toward the shallows too, to the wealth of food and protection in the dense underwater forests. The common periwinkle moves on its slippery foot onto the rocks in the intertidal zone where it feeds on microscopic algae, green seaweeds, and the mucus trails of other snails. I enjoyed writing that part. <laughs> <laughs> Broken strands of seaweed, if they don't wash up in a tide, float in mats out into deeper water, leaky contiquis, carrying a host of small and edible inshore creatures with them before they sink to the bottom. These mats attract fish and birds, such as phalaropes, Bonaparte's gulls, and leeches storm petrels, for the sudden gift of food they carry, and often in migration, birds use them as rest stops. Eventually, all the bits and pieces torn loose on a summer storm, the seaweed detritus, spin into the deep and disintegrate, enriching the planktonic life of the gulf, <coughs> excuse me, and thus enriching all those creatures living in this water from jellyfish to whales. I'm <coughs> going to skip ahead here and reach some more. Everybody can hear and everything's okay. Good. Seaweeds live in a world at the margins, from the high tide line down to where the sunlight reaches into the water's depths, however dimly. They create a special habitat that seems to be set apart from our world above water, but of course it's not. If you ask people to guess the next big harvest that we will take from the world's oceans, how many of them would say seaweed? Most of us cannot get through a day without meeting seaweeds in a disguised and processed form in toothpaste, pudding, pie fillings, and other soft foods in makeup soaps, dog and cat foods, cattle feed, and farm fertilizers. Many people in the world, especially in Asia, eat seaweeds daily as vegetables, sugar kelp, alaria, and laver, carrageenan, and dulse, wrapped, stirred, chopped, or sprinkled, dried or steamed, or simmered in soups. We can't save what's left of our wild and natural resources or keep our inshore waters free of pollution and alive with native species of all sorts without providing people who live by and in these places with jobs that sustain them. Seaweed harvesting supports coastal workers who need the work, breathing a bit of life back into small town fishing communities gutted by the loss of fish. It offers jobs for biologists, who study how wild creatures use inshore habitat. For industrial scientists 
who study what else we can make from it, for the people who pack it and sell it and ship it, and for those who work in factories who make it into things we use. This book is about seaweeds and seaweed harvesting. It is also a collection of stories about individual people who work and live at the shore and what they have shared with me of their lives. And it, it is about wildlife, fish, birds, snails and clams, the tiny scuds and the big eagle throwing a dark shadow across the bay. They teach me about what's worth saving. So that's part of my intro. And I've tried to cover everything. So you have no way out but going through seaweed. <laughs> um, I want to start with this little anecdote that may seem slightly off topic, but I don't think it is. Years ago, I was introduced to Helen Nearing at the Grand Theater in Ellsworth. And I told her quite enthusiastically that we had bought all her books, taken most, but not all, of her advice, lived in a cabin in the woods without electricity, and that I wor worked cutting fish at the fish factory down at the harbor. That was the wrong thing to add. <laughs> I was immediately taken to task for over-harvesting and for the infliction of pain. And frankly, it pissed me off a little bit back then because I, like all the other women standing at the fish belt and cutting the back ends of herring off so that they could be packed into little cans to be called sardines, needed the money. Sardines, a herring species from the eastern side of the Atlantic and around the Mediterranean Sea, are not the same species as Atlantic herring we have here in the Gulf and of Maine. And the Atlantic, I'm sorry, the Atlantic herring is larger than sardines and found on both sides of the Atlantic. They occur in enormous schools, but here in the Gulf of Maine, they've been severely overfished. Without that prompt from Helen, I would have not gone home and written in a white heat my essay, Factory Days. I wrote about the sound of the big tank trucks barreling down the pond road at night in the dark, carrying fish from Canada to the factory because we'd fished out our herring here along the coast of Maine, and the factory whistle going off at dawn, and all the women who worked there getting up in their surrounding houses in the semi-dark and getting ready to drive down to the harbor to cut fish. This sounds like the 1800s, I promise. It was the 1970s. And I wrote about how our plastic aprons and our taped hands were coated with fish eggs because the Canadians were doing just what we had done, which was to harvest herring as they came together in inshore waters to spawn. Most importantly, I wrote what the woman whose fish tray was next to mine told me. I'm cutting my daughter's future so that I can take care of her today. <clears throat> what does this have to do with seaweeds? It has to do with what we do in regard to wild species. We are changing. We are beginning to notice and study the needs of other species and to care about those needs. But we have more work to do. And we need to learn how to take but not too much. We have to change the way we do things. <clears throat> I'm going to read you some more. I have to tell you, uh, in case anybody is going to ask me, why did I ever pick seaweed to write a book about? So uh, some people have heard this anecdote. Samantha's heard it <laughs> quite a few times. Um, I have an agent in New York City, and I was giving her my list of topics for essays. I'm a narrative, I consider myself a narrative essayist. And, um, and I was going down the list, all, all the topics I thought were fascinating, and she was totally silent. And for a minute I thought, maybe, you know, the connection broke. <laughs> maybe she's not there on the other end. 
uh, which he was. And uh, then I got to going out with a, a dear friend who harvests seaweed and cutting seaweed with her and learning how that worked. And she said, my agent, oh, Susan, write a book about seaweed. And I thought, there's really nothing to say about seaweed. <laughs> I mean, I could eke out maybe an essay, and it would be fun to be out in a boat with his friend. But I was very wrong, because um, I could write another book about seaweed. I'm not going to, but I could. And the thing is, by, by taking all that time, and it did take me five years to write this skinny little book, um, I had learned a great deal from very smart people who were very patient with me and uh, taught me a lot. Uh, let's see, what, where was I? What am I going to read to you now? Page 8 and 9. So, I wanted to make the Gulf of Maine bigger, in a sense, than its borders. I mean, we know the Gulf of Maine touches Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maine, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. But I wanted it to be more in the American psyche. <clears throat> I thought my book needed that, and also I thought it was true. So this is how I attempted to do it. At his studio on Prout's Neck in 1885, Winslow Homer completed his iconic painting of a Gulf of Maine fisherman, The Fog Warning. In 1883, when he's 47 years old, Homer had moved to this peninsula, which lies on the east side of the Scarborough River estuary, a few miles south of Massacre Pond, the site of 17th century battles between settlers and the native tribes. The peninsula reaches straight into the Gulf of Maine without any island buffers. From his studio on the second floor of his converted carriage house, the painter began his late great works of weather and wa rocks and water and, of course, the people for whom this was home, that had been a part of the American ma imagination. In a real, immediate sense, the Gulf of Maine belongs to all of us through these canvases, which tell you something of who we are in the world. You probably know the fog warning, the fisherman rowing his dory to the mothership, a dark bank of fog rolling in across the water toward him. Because of the water's swell, the inside of his dory is pitched upward in our direction, and in the hull lie two enormous dead halibut, the beautiful, tasty, monster fish that were once common in our inshore waters. By Homer's time, the halibut catch had just started its nosedive, and inshore halibut fishermen hired themselves out to larger ships that sailed offshore for the fish that remained. This is what you see in the painting, a fisherman rowing his catch to the ship, hoping to close the gap before the fog erases all sign of her. He is no longer an independent inshore operator of his own boat, and the fish he's caught are at the end of plenty. Today the painting shocks us with the wild beauty and the formidable danger of our former fisheries, and a warning, not a fog, but of how quickly a good thing can disappear. I can't leave until I read every word. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, let's see. Uh, when my book came out um, and I started giving talks, I did want to reassure people that it includes some stories of the history of our relationships from all over the world with our oceans, waters, species, and habitats. I could not tell the stories of seaweed species here and around the world without writing of how we have squandered our oceans. But my book is also about some terrific people working very hard on this coast and in other places throughout the world, trying to understand how wild systems function. That's not easy. 
to understand, and how to keep wild habitat and species and coastal communities like ours alive. Getting <clears throat> these things together so that they work together, the harvest and the protection is hard, but it's not impossible. We are learning more about wild systems that are the basis of life on Earth, the complex interrelationships between species and species, and between species and habitats. I wrote this book to explore and present to the general public the science of place. An educated public is a powerful voice that can affect fisheries policies and some of the other ways that we have treated the wild in the water and on the land. Smart, committed voices <clears throat> that know the difficult and sometimes contradictory facts and can figure out how to evalu evaluate them, how to fix what's broken, these voices can make a difference in neighborhoods, in towns, and in countries. <coughs> they can change things. I'm going to read you something from the underwater forest. <coughs> How are we doing? Are we okay? Any questions? Yep. Don't forget them if you have them. <coughs> when my tro <coughs> I seem to have a frog in my throat. <coughs> I have some in here somewhere. Oh, here it is. I think it's water. Might be gin. <laughs> You want some too. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let's see. Maybe I'll put it closer by. When my children were small, I took them to the shore. It would be low tide and we walked over the pebbly mud and parted the seaweed strands, the bladder racks, and the knotted racks attached to the big rocks that the glacier had dragged from miles away, we peered beneath the seaweeds. The outer layers had dried in the air, but the under layers held a briny wetness that made the creatures we found within especially bright. Starfish, the egg capsules of the dog wilks, small sea snails whose eggs looked like tiny Greek amphora, green crabs as new and small as my children's fingernails, young green sea urchins, limpets, sideways swimming scuds, yellow periwinkles, sometimes a hermit crab or a sea anemone. It seemed right somehow to be bringing young and growing children to the edge of the bay where life had evolved so far back in time that it was hardly imaginable, as if this place with its seaweeds were the proof we needed that we had come from a world of water and that everything might have looked at one time something like this. When we are children, our psyches tend to become imprinted on the places we know and love. And for many of us, that edge where water and land meet is one that stays with us all our lives. I didn't think of it then, but now I believe I was offering them exactly this their home place to imprint upon so that they might go into the larger world with a sense of where they come from and thus a sense of who they are. As you know, the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than some say 95%, some say 99% of all the other bodies of salt water throughout the world. We are suddenly a test case, a canary in the mind, mine, and in the mind. <laughs> and how we figure our way forward will have an influence on how other people respond to the crises of their waters in other parts of the world. Because they can learn from us, and we can learn from our successes, and also, and perhaps especially, from our mistakes. Our Gulf of Maine, <clears throat> before it started to warm, was always referred to as a boreal soup. It had so much planktonic life. It had one-celled algae 
which are called microalgae, meaning, of course, little algae. <clears throat> it had tiny animals that float beside them and eat them, the zooplankton. These things are eaten by whales and fish and birds. The phytoplankton go out, give off a huge amount of oxygen. So in cold waters, these one-celled algae and tiny animals do best, and they oxygenate both the air above and the water below. Now, with the extreme warming of the top layer of the water in the Gulf of Maine, they are not as abundant. This affects everything and everyone. Seaweeds are called macroalgae. They um, are usually in the inshore, but not always. We have a place called um, uh, Cassius Ledge, and there are other places where rocks come up through, toward the surface, and there's enough, the water's clear and clean, and there's enough sunshine to get down so the kelps and all kinds of fabulous seaweeds can grow there. But along the shore, when you go out and look and see this kind of mustardly colored seaweed, what it is is it's knotted rack. Another thing it's called, and you're going to be given a test before you leave. <laughs> and if you don't pass it, you have to listen to this talk all over again. <laughs> it's called Ascophyllum. They also call it rockweed. Um, <clears throat> the thing about seaweeds is that they're single cells, and those single cells usually work just the way the uh, phytoplankton does uh, um, out on the surface of the ocean. In other words, every cell is doing its own work. But they're colonial, they live together, and they have a certain amount of simple systems, but they're not like land plants. And so I have tried to avoid in my book using the word plant, although I noticed that um, scientists actually use it very comfortably. I was trying not to use it because it ain't a plant. Um, <coughs> The thing about uh, what's happening in Maine is that a lot of people are working very hard to try to figure out how to save the Gulf of Maine and what's coming next. What can be saved, what we have to let go of, what we can plan for next. And the thing that's important are these phytoplankton and these seaweeds that um, nourish the ocean, they take um, the seaweeds, remove some of the acid that uh, comes from the carbon. They also give um, oxygen um, back into the air and the water. But the thing that's the most important is that they're forests. I mean, they are forests. And if you've ever gone out in a dock and you've watched that ascophyllum come up with the tide and just kind of float there, yeah, you know it looks like a bunch of trees in the wind. Mm -hmm. And um, you also see, if you lie down in that dock and spend some time there, an awful lot of critters moving through it. So um, uh, it's essential. But the other thing that's essential is that we need jobs. We need jobs that give people a sense of self-respect, and we need jobs that provide a living and uh, in a lot of coastal towns, um, we have very depleted fisheries. So we have to figure out how to put these things together and make jobs on the ocean that actually help the inshore rather than hurt it. And so I hope all of you will put your thinking caps on because we need, we need to do this pretty soon. I'm an essayist and also a storyteller. In other words, a narrative nonfiction writer. I decided in order to write about seaweeds for the general reader, I had to tell stories of people, history, places, discoveries. Beginning the book, how to get a general reader interested enough to turn the page. And then bringing, bringing the reader along from chapter to chapter to, to seaweed. And slowly to the stories of people and their interrelationship with seaweeds. I'm going to read to you now 
something about Ireland because I actually uh, didn't go to Ireland, nor did I go to the Philippines, but I found out about the people who knew in Ireland, and um, then I picked their brains. So um, part of this is um, a, uh, a tribute to uh, my great-grandfathers from County Mayo. Anyhow, occasionally you can still find them out on islands, crumbling near the water's edge. The old 18th and 19th century kilns built out of stones gathered from the shore. People on Irish and Scottish coasts and in Brittany cut and burned seaweeds in the pits of those kilns to make potash and pearl ash valuable potassium salts. The wet seaweeds, Ascophyllum, Fucus, and the kelps had to be lugged up from the shore, carefully turned and dried, and then burned at a temperature that would render them into products that were sold to make glass and soap, to be bleached linens, to encourage bread to rise, <clears throat> and to use as fertilizer to sweeten the fields. In the boom time, around 1809, Ireland was exporting 5,410 tons of potash a year. It was backbreaking work that whole neighborhoods engaged in, and at its height, the many kiln fires created smoke so thick it endangered the lives of nearby pasturing calves. It wasn't long before the seaweeds in some places were overcut, the shores laid bare. Then as suddenly as it had appeared, the market vanished when potassium salt deposits were discovered underground in Germany and in Chile, and the mines were open. The burning of seaweed resurfaced with the discovery that the ash residue could be used to extract iodine, but that too disappeared when deposits of iodine were found below ground. Left alone, seaweeds regrew with farmers coming to the shore to harvest them for their gardens, and gatherers cutting favorite species to eat and to feed to their domestic animals. Over time, the old kilns were disassembled by wind and rain and snow. My great-grandfather was born in County Mayo, a land of blanket bogs and clay on the western shore of Ireland facing the North Atlantic. He was just a boy when he sailed to America with his parents in the 1860s. Somehow they survived the famine. I want to add something quickly here is the people in Mayo and other, other north uh, western shores of Ireland actually um, ate seaweeds during the famine and it helped keep them alive. Even today you can see the ghost of the famine that provoked their flight and that of so many others in the ridges on the Mayo Hills. Old shapes of potato gardens suddenly abandoned as if time had stopped and in a sense it had. Either the villagers who cultivated the plots were too weak to dig into them anymore, or the digging would have unearthed only blight, or both, and they left them where they were. Before the famine, the Irish farmers of Mayo and the Aran Islands and other sparse places near the coast, where the ground was poor and the rain was hard, had learned to fashion gardens that produced abundant, life-giving potatoes enough to feed a growing family and the family cow. They called them lazy beds, and some farming coastal people in Ireland today have initiated that practice again. But a lazy bed is not for the lazy. And then I tell you how to do it, and I'll tell you it's exhausting. I'm going to cut that part out. You'll have to buy the book if you want to dig a lazy bed. <laughs> um, on the Aran Islands, there is only an occasional thin skin of turf over bare rock to make a lazy bed. The old-time farmers would collect sand from the beach coves, mix it with decomposing seaweeds, and what little there was with turf of turf, and make their own soil, into which they set the potato seed, 
then shoveled more of the dirt and sand and seaweed mixture over the seed, building up the beds with channels for rain runoff on either side. In his 1907 book, The Aran Islands, J.M. Singh wrote this. The other day, the men of this house made a new field. There was a slight bank of earth under the wall of the yard and another in the corner of the cabbage garden. The old man and his eldest son dug out the clay with the care of men working in a gold mine for a transfer to a flat rock in a sheltered corner of their holding where it was mixed with sand and seaweed and spread out in a layer upon the stone. Can you imagine? Uh, that's the end of the quote. This is me speaking. It may be a seaside farmer's prejudice, but it's claimed that nothing tastes quite so good as a potato grown in seaweed gathered from the nearby shore. If you want to see an example, of the that, that's how we plant our potatoes here, because that's how Scott and Aaron did it, with seaweed and hay. Ooh. And sand. Yeah, and he called it a lazy pit? Yeah, I don't think, I don't remember him calling it a lazy pit, but that's how he did it. Well, what they do in Ireland is they dig up the turf and put it, they put, um, uh, let's see, seaweed, yep. potato, yep. seaweed, yep. turf. Uh, instead of turf, Scott used compost. Yeah, well. He would put seaweed, uh, a little bit of hay, put the uh, potatoes, cut, you know, the cut potatoes, he'd cover that with compost, more seaweed, more hay, and more compost, and as the, um, as the potato plants grow, he would add more compost and more hay as they grew taller. As in Ireland, because it rains so much, I mean, it's been raining a lot here, they, um, on the other side of the lazy bed, they dig it out, they keep digging it out, and putting that dirt on top of the lazy bed and making channels for the water to run. Right, and the great thing about it, and there's also an example, across from the swings in downtown Blue Hill, there's a garden that has a lazy bed, uh, is that you're left the next year with a very fertile piece of land yes, that you absolutely. can grow other things besides potatoes. So you right. move the potatoes to another spot yeah. and do what you're calling the lazy bed. And that's how Scott did it. You know, I think it's so funny that they would call something a lazy bit. That's one of the hardest things yeah, to exactly, do. Yeah, exactly, yeah. It's a lot of work, but it, it, it's, it's very easy to harvest because you don't have to dig in the dirt also. Well, that's true. That's true. Um, okay. Um, so, in, instead of reading to you about this, because this is a longer story, I just want to tell you about some of the stories I discovered. And this was one I had gotten so into um, seaweeds that, um, and I was just, that's what I did for so long, that I thought that everybody knew the stories about seaweeds that I knew. And I was telling my daughter-in-law, I said, well, I'm not going to write this story because everybody knows it. She looked at me and she said, well, nobody knows it. You know, write that story. And so I did, and it really is a touching story. It's about Kathleen Drew Baker, and she was an English woman. Let's see if I can get these steps right. And she was a phycologist, which means she studied seaweed. She was a seaweed scientist. And she did uh, her, hang in there, her, her species that she was studying was um, porphyra, which we call laver, and which the Japanese call nori. Um, you know, I think it might be pronounced laver. What do you know? Is it laver? Okay, laver. Thank you. Hop in any time to correct me. It's perfectly all right. Uh, anyhow, uh, so what phycologists thought was that there were two different species of seaweed. One was laver, laver, and the other was some other thing, and they looked not at all alike. What she found out is that they were different par parts of the same organism, different stages. Mm -hmm. they, it was, there was a gamete stage and a sporophyte stage. And that, um, 
So that's what she wrote a very famous paper on. Okay, now over in Japan, they used to call papyra or nori gambler's grass because they couldn't figure out what one of the stages was. Nobody could. Uh, Kathleen did, but nobody before that knew. So they put sticks in the water and maybe the little um, little germlings would attach to those sticks and the beautiful nori sheets would grow. Well, blades would grow. And it was so precious for the Japanese that the instead of taxes you could pay the emperor in, in nori. Mm -hmm. um, but then there was World War II and Japan was shattered. Everything was shattered. And uh, she had actually in the early 50s written this paper. But they, they, were, they were not growing nori. They were having, their rice was contaminated. It was a disaster. But somebody in Japan read her paper. And they said, oh my God, that's the problem. So they start bringing back the nori industry. And it is the biggest seaweed industry now in the world, making nori sheets. And you know, it's like wine tasting or something. The families make this, or communities, they grow the nori, they know how to do it now, and they take those nori sheets to uh, a place where it's processed in, I mean nori blades, I'm sorry, to a place where it's processed into nori sheets, which is like making paper, and then the people come who want to buy it, and they look at the color, and they nibble little ends of it. It's all very high-end. It sounds fascinating. Here's the thing that I like so much. Wales and England, they, some people know about Kathleen Trubaker. In Japan, they have a little shrine to her, and they celebrate her life because inadvertently, she gave them their life back in a way. And it made a huge difference in the country. Who would have thunk it? By the time they were doing that, she was dead. Mm. Yeah. Here's, but yeah. Now, um, yeah. The seaweed industry in Japan is known as by the pollution from Fukushima. Right? That's, that's what we gather. Any, anything from Japan. It affected the West Coast. Okay. Yeah, I know. Well, you know, the Earhart's who have Maine Sea vegetable, co co Maine, coast of Maine, Maine Sea Coast vegetables. I've written a whole chapter on it. But you have to realize I wrote this book a year ago. Um, they, all of a sudden, after this disaster, they were getting phone, panicky phone calls from the West Coast that nobody would touch anything in the Pacific Ocean and that they had to step up what they were doing to sell. And they didn't have enough. That's when they decided that they had to move from wild cut to aquaculturally harvested seaweeds. And they're beginning that transition now because, um, of, well, that's one reason. The other reason is more and more people are eating seaweeds. The thing about Maine, now I'm going totally off script, which is fine. The thing about Maine is because we're really basically pretty new to seaweed harvest, um, we can do things right. We can learn from places that have done things wrong. And between you and me and the lamppost, if you look at some of those seaweed aquaculture farms off the coast of China, and also in the Philippines, and also in Malaysia. You will see huge places with very little space between the growing and the, of the blades, and boats going in and out. And if you, if you can't flush out that seaweed with fresh um, water that's full of nutrients, that seaweed's taking in everything you give it, everything that's in the water. So, that's not a good way to grow it. It probably makes money, but the thing is, it's not a good, yes? I wanted to bring up something that's very pertinent to this. Um, you probably may be following it, the um, 
uh, aquaculture farms, uh, Nordic Aqua Farms, a uh, big Norwegian company. They're trying to build in the, um, Penobscot Bay the uh, largest uh, aquaculture farm in the world. You mean for fish? Fish, yes. yes, yes fish. For salmon. Yeah. Well, he, he, uh, I don't want to get off track, but I want to just say one thing, then we'll go to it. I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. The Gulf of Maine no. is getting quickly ruined. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> that could happen, but maybe it won't. And maybe it won't because we have an educated public that won't stand for it to happen. And the people and the harvesters that I met, and this is sort of in the beginning of what could happen with seaweed aquaculture or wild seaweed harvest in Maine. They're very conscious and they're very careful. That's what I found, not probably everybody, but the people I met were. And, and they cared about what they were doing and doing it right. In other words, they had learned from mistakes we had made. As far as um, the salmon, I just want to say one short sentence. I mean, one could t talk forever about the salmon, but is that the worst thing is that ships go out and they catch all these other wild fish to make into pellets to feed the salmon. People are now experimenting with combining seaweeds, which have the omegas. See, the, the reason these small fish are caught and fed to salmon is they need the omegas. Those small fish have, have gotten those primarily from seaweeds, okay? So it's worked its way up the food chain. If we can mix that with something with protein and pelletize it, I think that we can get rid of that harvest that's out in the ocean. The minute we get rid of that, we'll be doing a favor to many species, including whales, including bluefin tuna, you name it. We take too much. We have to learn how to share. And this, um, there's so many exciting new ideas that use seaweed that I am still convinced that Steve, seaweed is the basis of absolutely everything. But, um, <laughs> anybody else? I have a question. Yeah. The phytoplankton, mm -hmm. is that the right word? Uh -huh. Are they dependent <clears throat> on the temperature of the water? Yes. Mm -hmm. And are they going to be injured as it warms up? Yes, well, they're going to diminish. Diminish. And that has already happened. I'm sure you've read that our whales are now, our whales, our personal whales are now going up to Newfoundland yeah. and around the, uh, the Gulf of St. Lawrence where the water is cold. Cold water holds more oxygen. It has, that's why we were, it was said we had a boreal soup because it was very cold. It was full. You could pick up uh, a glass of that water at a certain time in this in the early spring, in the summer, in the fall. And it would be cloudy with mo things moving around. I mean, it was just rich. rich. Yeah. Um, you know what I'm going to do? Is uh, I am going to read you an Aldo Leopold quote. <clears throat> and then when I was giving a talk about a month ago, at toward the end of it, the, a woman said to me, well, what's the take home? <laughs> and so I read her the uh, end of my book a little bit. So I'm going to do that just in case you want to take home. But the take home from me, from me to you, is that um, you're all here tonight. I'm very grateful and that we can make things better as long as we are vigilant and smart and take the time to learn about these things and work together. Okay, here's the Aldo Leopold quote. Our tools are better than we are and grow better faster than we do. They suffice to crack the atom, to command the tides, but they do not suffice for the oldest task in human history to live on a piece of land without spoiling it.
That's a perfect quote for right here, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, here's the take home. <laughs> I wrote this book to explore the complexity and beauty of a wild inshore syst system to which I believe we owe a great deal. But the people I've learned from have given me more than that. They startle me with the depth of their care for where they work and the dedication to the work they do. Sometimes it seems to me they have made themselves part of the wild systems they work within as witness and voice. When I first arrived to make my home on this coast, I learned that the fishermen down at the harvest knew things, all sorts of uh, harbor, knew things, all sorts of little and big things about the water. Their work was a craft, some might even say an art, and when they went out in their boats, they read the water, the sky, the tides, they go out the best of them with a sense of self-respect that came from this attentive and hard-won expertise, this relationship with a wild place that is both dangerous and giving. But I don't romanticize them, for they endorsed the myth that the abundance would last forever, as did so many others, even when all the signs they saw with their educated eye pointed to the plain hard fact that it wouldn't. What we can learn from the fishermen of the past is this. The wild test people, hones their skills, offers them a way to be in the world that can give them pride. If we can take that sort of learning and bend it towards scientific inquiry, careful harvest, and resource protection, we will be creating something fine. The purpose of regulating the wild seaweed harvest in the state of Maine and in the world at large is twofold. First, to identify and protect essential habitat, and second, to build a new model of how to manage ocean resources that doesn't edge them toward oblivion. Take home. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, the writing is beautiful. I'm completely convinced by what you report uh, about the people who are doing it right. If you were to write another book, would you focus on FNC, Dow Chemical, uh, and what, what they're doing with the harvesting? I'm trying to figure out whether I have another book in me right now. Well, maybe you prefer not to <laughs> dwell on the negative. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of negative things that we get hit with every day, just open the paper. But um, nobody's asked me about the uh, Supreme Court case, the main Supreme Court case. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Ask me. <laughs> ask me. Well, Go I'd ahead. I'd like to know your opinion on, uh, on that. My opinion is that I, we, have, we are lucky enough to have here tonight one of the people who fought tooth and nail, to um, uh, either stop or moderate Ascophyllum harvest that she felt, along with a lot of other people, was um, being done to the detriment of the inshore life. And the man who filed the suit against Acadian sea plants, and it is Ken Ross and Robin Seeley. Oh, <laughs> I think they're here to help me out when I don't know how to answer something. But um, do you, either of you want to say something, or shall I say something about you? Say, say what I think? Well, um, oh, about the ruling. Well, I was just saying to Ken, I think this is an open thing. I'm still trying to figure it out, what I feel. I mean, I don't think it was wrong. I think it's totally changed the game plan. And for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, the Maine Supreme Court has said that Ascophyllum, that beautiful mustard seaweed, that has been cut by industry along our coast, actually belongs to the 
upland land of, landowner. And that the cutters have to ask permission of the landowner before they can cut the seaweed. And this has made the people who harvest the seaweed, who had jobs, a little pissed, to say the least. Um, on the other hand, there are biologists, Robin isn't alone here, there are biologists, people who are involved with birds, people who are involved with fish, people who are involved with all kinds of creatures that live in the inshore, who say that we're sacrificing habitat. We've worked our way down the food chain, and now we're, we're sacrificing habitat. And if we do that, we can't bring some of the species back that even though the Gulf is, of Maine is warming, might be able to come back. But we have to have that forest on the edge of the shore. The thing is, I believe, I'm taking up all the oxygen here, but I believe in the precautionary principle. And that is, don't do something if there's any idea that it may ruin something. Don't go in and do it first, say, oh, well, yeah, you're right, it did ruin it. Maybe we should stop doing it or do something else. It's very hard to get that back. So, do more studies. And the DMR, the Maine Department of Marine Resources, does a lot of work for fishermen, but they should, I wish, they transfer some of that money over to do more work on research. We need research for everything, alewives, seaweeds, we, ne we, we need it. The other thing I believe is that we should have a managed commons, and I know that sounds ideal, but in other words, if a community has shoreline, they have ascophyllum, they can set, in an ideal world, I believe they could set a way of harvesting it that suits them, and if they blow it, they've lost it. But they can't go somewhere else. And what started this whole thing, to my mind, was the Canadian company coming down and harvesting in Cobscoke Bay. Mm -hmm. That ticked people off. Because they cut all the sea and all the rock weed in Nova Scotia. They were overcutting in Nova Scotia. Uh, Robin, do you want to speak to this? Yeah, I, I, when I try to explain it to people, I rely on a quote from the famous Canadian politics of Dalhousie University of Nova Scotia who said that basically what's happened in Nova Scotia is the entire virgin forest of Nova Scotia has been transformed into a managed forest. So it's not that they're taking every bit of seed. They're transforming it from one thing into another. So the difference between an old growth forest and a hay field. And the question is, what does that mean to the ecosystem to have this whole scale transformation of habitat from one thing into another? And they don't know. But it's noteworthy to me that she said all of those social is now the managed forest. There's no version of this one. And that's what we'd like to halt in the name of transformation from one thing into another. And what I find ironic is that <clears throat> so many of us went to an academic conference at the University of Maine, which all, all the all the principals, all the people that should be interested in this, was the conference on ecosystem-based management, which is which is the new thing, which is exactly in academic terms what Susan has just been spent all this time talking about, which is stop managing for one species. Look at the look at the whole ecosystem. Look at the impacts throughout the ecosystem. So the academic community and the management community is with one hand embracing this new approach, but we've already started down this road with broccoli harvesting, thinking mainly about it as, as one species, as how many millions of pounds mm -hmm. can they cut at 400 pounds self-fertilizer process in Canada or whatever. So we're already down that road. Meanwhile, the, the far-sighted thinkers in Maine are talking about ecosystem-based management, and those things are entirely different. So we may get the ecosystem-based management, but if, without something to slow it down, are we going to be past the point of return and end up with the whole thing mm -hmm. losing its first mm -hmm. And thanks to Ken and the other plaintiffs, you know, we have 
I think that um, we find that these battles are circular, you know, but uh, you fight this one and then you perhaps have to fight and <laughs> again in ten years or whatever. But the thing is that we don't see beneath the ocean. We imagine maybe, but or we think the ocean is waves with a gull flying over. But the thing is there's this incredibly rich life that we need uh, biologists to talk about, we need photographs and movies to see those fish and everything. And my absolute love is Cash's Ledge, as I think I mentioned. And it's in the Gulf of Maine. And it has a rock called the Amen Rock. I love it. And all the kelps are growing up. I mean, gorgeous. You can Google it when you go home. And there are the cod we lost. They're still there. Big cod going through. Hake, you know. Um, the kelps are some of the thickest places of kelps growing in the Atlantic Ocean. So there's still hope. Maybe I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much for your time.